my name is Sister Wendy Beckett. Today we will speak about India, the crown jewel of the British Empire, its main source of raw materials. As European powers began to take on more and more colonies, they simply wanted to gain access to more raw materials to help fuel industries at home. In the meantime, creating larger markets and demand for the goods which the home industries produced. Now this was the basic concept behind the mercantile system. India perfectly fits the bill for the mercantilist system because it both has a large population of around 300 million people and it also has very large access to raw materials from Britain to use in its production. Now India also had the ability to grow many cash crops which were forced to be grown by the uh, for Indians to grow these cash crops by the British because they wanted to produce more wealth. This led to a drop in self-sufficiency amongst the Indians and famines later in the 1800s which devastated the region. However, the, India, the British did not see this as a major problem because they were still making money on India because India still had it, India's only option when it came to buying um, goods was to buy it through the English and their only option was also to sell their raw materials to the English as well. The British almost saw themselves as being superior beings, as being civilized people, and by utilizing their enlightenment philosophies, they felt justified in taking advantage of the Indian people, because in doing so, and in, through the mercantilist system, they were also increasing the civil capacity. They were increasing schooling, housing, hospitals, roads, bridges, and civil infrastructure. So they felt that while they were benefiting off the work of the Indians and um, off India as a colony, they were also returning something by benefiting this nation, taking it out of the backwoods and bringing it to the forefront of modern society. However, what this led to in total was a reliance of, of the Indian people upon the British. As the Indians no longer governed themselves, they la began to lack the ability to do so in the long run, making it less self-sufficient and more reliant upon the British for protection, for goods, and for uh, continuous improvement and governance of the region. So because of this, what we saw was that India began to suffer in the long run, and Indian independence became less and less as they became more reliance on their British overlords. This British desire to find more raw materials as well as new markets to sell their goods as a result of industrialization manifested itself in the creation of the British East India Company. It was founded in 1600 and given a monopoly of all English trade in Asia. And by the end of the 17th century, India became the focal point of the company's trade. The company established settlements in Indian provinces where cotton textiles were available. These settlements eventually became major commercial towns. During the first half of the 1700s, the British presence was mainly along the coast. While progressing through the 1700s, the British waged more wars on eastern and southern India, pushing their control into central India. A lot of these wars were initiated by several factors, including the fall of the Mughal Empire in 1707, fragmenting India into many smaller states. These states uh, were religiously founded because of the Muslim presence in the east, the Sikhs in the west, the Tamil speakers in the south, and many other religious factions. There is also much competition between the British and the French, and there were there was much private ambition or wealth in India. Both of these factors caused the British East India Company to push um, deeper into India. There was the Battle of Plassey in 1757. Robert Clive led the East India Company troops in a decisive victory over Indian forces allied with the French. They crushed the weak Mughal Empire, or what was left of it, leaving the British East India Company as the significant power in India. In fact, they would remain the dominant power in India until 1858. By the end of the 1700s, the British began to extend up the Ganges Valley to Delhi and over most of southern India. From these wars, the company was able to further profit. By this time, the Indians provided skilled cloth and silk artisans, sugar, opium, indigo dye, coffee, tea, jute, and merchant and baker 
banker services as well. The British influence quickly transitioned to total control over Bengal from its original influence of trade. The governors of the company's commercial settlements became governors of provinces and many of its servants became administrators. Armies were created mostly with Indian sepoys, which were used to defend the company's territories and coerce neighboring states into compliance. The sepoys were Indians who were hired into fighting for the British East India Company and they were used to uh, just reinstate control of the British East India Company. The company began controlling the courts and taxes by the end of the 18th century and also began innovating the local government, education, and religion. They also tried to change many of the traditions of the Indians, such as the tradition of Sati. Here with Professor Zabimufu Dukmariot, Professor of World History at the University of Colorado at Boulder. So, Professor, what exactly are the Sati? The Sati is a Indian tradition in which a widowed woman would throw herself upon the funeral pyre of her husband, lighting herself on fire and sacrificing herself to the gods. Interesting. So, how does this apply to um, British imperialization of India? Well, it was a very common Indian practice. Therefore, well, it wasn't exactly common, but there would be hundreds of cases in each region every year. So what would happen was the English at first attempted to repress Sati through the Evangelical Church. However, this became unsuccessful. So eventually, I believe it was 1829, but I may be mistaken in that number, uh, the British passed laws in which it actually banned Sati unless it was under the direct observation of a religious official, and then they later banned it outright. However, it still occurs today. It actually, the most recent case was back in 2010. In addition to the tradition of Sati, people such as Charles Grant and William Wilberforce sought to stamp out Indian superstition, and men like Jeremy Bentham, Thomas Macaulay, James Stuart Mill, they sought to reform the law, education, and trade. However, the British did improve India. They built a massive railroad network, one of the largest in the world at its time, a modern road network, telephone and telegraph lines, dams, bridges, irrigation canals, schools, colleges. They also improved sanitation and public health. The company also formed alliances with neighboring states for protection, which actually ended up drawing them into more wars as these neighboring states would fight their enemies. And then Richard Wellesley, the company's governor, was willing to use total war and rejected limited commitment for imposing the British control by the end of the 18th century, further pushing the company into a more militant power and more dominant power. All of this control and increased dominance and increased force over all facets of Indian life caused the Sepoy mutiny. For British colonization of India, as nationalism spread throughout the country, time was running out. So you see, the two sides, the British colonizers and the Indian sepoys, were simply out of tune. There was a light at, at the end of the tunnel for Indians. See, they were about to douse the fires of the British colonizers. The Sepoy Rebellion, or Rebellion of 1857, was directly sparked by the use of cartridges greased with pork and beef fat by the Indian army. Hindu and Islamic soldiers within the army, also known as sepoys, were outraged with this blatant violation of their religious beliefs. Soon after this news broke, soldiers began to refuse to serve, leading to a multitude of arrests. On March 10, 1857, soldiers began to openly rebel, not only against the use of animal fat on the cartridges, but also against Thai British taxes imperial embarrassment of local traditional rulers. The soldiers captured the city of Delhi, and the year-long revolt spread throughout the British Dominion. Eventually, however, the revolt collapsed, mainly due to fragmentation from religious and economic differences among the rebels, officially bringing an end to any semblance of the Mughal Empire. The East India Company returned to control, but not before attracting the concern of Queen Victoria. The Crown officially took over direct control of India in 1858 
beginning a period of Indian history known as the Braj. Hoping to make up for the mistakes of the East India Company and gain legitimacy as a ruler of the Indian populace, Victoria unintentionally made previously flexible religious practices rigid in her attempts at toleration. The Queen also encouraged a reorganization of the Indian economy, stifling industrial growth in favor of the direction of raw materials to the empire. Overall, the Sepoy Rebellion further separated the mindsets of the British and their colonial subjects, and also encouraged Indian nationalists and anti-colonials within India. Racism also greatly increased on both sides, summarized by Lord Kitchener, the commander-in-chief of the Indian Army and a key officer within the British effort in World War I. Why was the British colonization of India justified in your mind? Well, it is this consciousness of the inherent superiority of the European which has won for us India. However well educated and clever a native may be, and however brave he may prove himself, I believe that no rank we can bestow on him would cause him to be considered an equal of the British officer. Simple. <laughs> Why was the Sepoy Rebellion unsuccessful? Well, the simple fact is, India was so fractured and divided. It just, I mean, oh, I can't even get my mind around how this could ever be successful. Multiple princes, factions, religions, it won't work. They couldn't unify. The British were able to crush them, crush them hard. Like the Union and the Confederacy. We shot Lincoln. Nationalism in India began to evolve in the early 1800s with a push for modernization and more involvement in the government by the Indians. Ram Mohan Roy was the father of modern India and he began to campaign to move India away from traditional practices and ideas such as the caste system and he pushed for western ways. Because of the British, all Indians were second class citizens in their own country. This caused the formation of the Indian National Congress, eventually in 1885. This was founded by Indian and English members of the Theosophical Society movement, most notably A. O. Hume. Original objective of the Congress was to achieve a greater share in government for educated Indians. The first president was Ramesh Chandra Bonerjee. Within a few years, the party began to advocate for many radical reforms, most notably the independence movement. By 1907, the party was split into two halves, the Garamdal, or extremists, and the Naramdal, or moderates, which was distinguished by their attitudes towards the British colonists. Mahatma Gandhi would later become president of the Congress, and under his leadership, they advocated against caste differences, untouchability, poverty, and religious and ethnic boundaries. Intonation on this, a third of a key up. No, no, no. Someone needs to go here, then someone else goes here, someone else goes here. One, two, three, four. <laughs> yeah. There goes the squid, yep. <laughs> 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 